Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are expressing, and from different points of view, outrage over the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and debating changes to regulations passed in recent years. We now have evidence of what happens when you ease up on the regulation for banks of that size. We just need to put those tougher constraints back in place and tell the regulators to toughen up against banks of that size. If the management of Silicon Valley Bank had known the difference between a banking textbook and an L.L. Bean catalog, Silicon Valley Bank would have never bought securities that are so sensitive to interest rate without hedging that risk. Congressman Brendan Boyle joins us now. He is a member of the House Budget Committee. He's actually the ranking Democrat on that committee. Congressman, good to see you. So it's been a volatile day within the conversation in America about banking and on the markets. Uh, late this afternoon, the Swiss National Bank put out a statement saying that it would provide liquidity, quote, unquote, if necessary, to Credit Suisse and that the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, quote, does not pose a risk of contagion to the Swiss banking system. Your reaction? Well, that certainly is a, an encouraging statement. Um, it, it would probably uh, add even more reassurance if we heard that from, a, say, a senior Treasury official with respect to Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, one of the arguments that I've heard out there is that SVB had such an unusual depositor base uh, and such unusual customers writ large that it's really more of a one-off and not something that is, uh, that is systemic. One thing we should also keep in mind, too, obviously, is that thanks to the reforms that passed post the 2008 crisis, we do have banks that are in far better position today, combined with the fact we don't have the situation and bad mortgages, obviously, that we had some uh, 15 years ago. To your point, Congressman, about the one-off or the black swan possibly effect of SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank New York, also thought of as a one-off. Credit Suisse could also be a one-off. But mm -hmm. anyone who's been to a pond just tells you three black swans cause alarms. Yeah, I, a few more one-offs, and suddenly uh, <laughs> we're not talking about isolated incidents. So. Uh, from my perspective as the ranking member of the Budget Committee, uh, it only strengthens my resolve that we do not need any drama this year when it comes to either the budget or especially the raising of the debt ceiling. We do have skittishness and nervousness right now in the markets. Washington, D.C. should do nothing that would add to it. We're going to get to that in a minute, but I want to take you back to May of 2018. There was a bill on the floor of the House for a final passage. It was uh, cleverly entitled the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. It changed some of the Dodd-Frank requirements on capital that smaller regional banks had to keep on hand. You voted against it. 33 House Democrats voted for it. It passed Congress and President Trump signed it. To what degree do you assess the SVB and Signature Bank collapses to that change in regulatory policy. Well, first, I'm very proud of my no vote. I think the events of the last week have vindicated that decision. Second, given that SVP was at approximately $200 billion in combined assets, under the old rules, in other words, had that piece of legislation not passed in 2018, they would have come under further scrutiny um, but the new law that was passed five years ago that I voted against raised the limit from $50 billion to $250 billion, meaning SVB uh, escaped the greater scrutiny or further stress tests that it needed to face. That obviously was a tragic mistake. So the contours of this banking volatility have already begun to play themselves out politically. Republicans say it's Biden inflation that is at the root cause of this. You just said we don't need any instability or lack of confidence about raising the debt ceiling. How do you expect that politics to play out? Yeah, well, I think some of my Republican colleagues were busy saying it was wokeness that brought about a, a bank failure. I, I give them credit for creativity. Um, it wasn't any of, of those things. There is one other element we have to throw into this, and that is COVID. Coming out of COVID, of course, uh, we have seen an incredible spike in inflation. 
the highest in more than 40 years. Now, fortunately, here in the United States, it has been coming down from its peak uh, in August. But because the Fed has raised rates by such a large degree in such a short period of time, I do worry that there are unintended consequences that come along with that. Obviously, the uh, management of SVP uh, made a tragic mistake in investing so much in 10-year treasuries and then got caught once there was a, a big uh, increase in those rates. Uh, so as we look to the future and, and the sort of things that will affect our further economic growth, we have to throw in the Fed uh, into the mix. And before I let you go, Congressman, there has been some talk in Congress about increasing FDIC protection for depositors, perhaps making it universal. It's currently, as you well know, $250,000 per depositor. Where do you come down on that? You know, this is very interesting. There might be some potential for bipartisan action here. One of the things, that, and I haven't committed myself to this yet, but I'm very uh, interested in any sort of legitimate proposal that, say, would increase that $250,000 to $500,000 or a million. I just want to make sure, though, it doesn't involve taxpayer money. In my view, you would increase the insurance charge that banks pay into the FDIC and use that to offer greater protection to depositors. That's the sort of thing that really could uh, give a boost of confidence to uh, depositors right now. Congressman Brendan Boyle, ranking Democrat on the House Budget Committee. We thank you, sir. Thank you.